Good morning. Rejoice in the Lord. Always. And again, I say, rejoice. Uh, recently, I was in a conversation with somebody, and uh, they asked, do we as Christians need to keep the Sabbath? And I said, well, Sunday isn't the Sabbath. The Sabbath happens on Saturday. And they said, wait, what? <laughs> and so... As we started to talk through things, we remember we've been going through the Old Testament, and we've been going through Exodus, and we're coming now this week to the fourth commandment, which states that we are to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And for us as Christians, that leads to a lot of different questions. First, is that if the Sabbath was on Saturday, then do we now switch it and celebrate it on Sunday? Did the New Testament change the day of the Sabbath? Should a Christian still observe the Sabbath? And if so, when and how? Well, if you're here last week, you know, I, I preached to nine of the ten, and I said, we're going to wait on the Sabbath until next week. And after the sermon, someone said, I was really bummed you didn't talk about the Sabbath because that was the one I really want to know more about. I said, well, good news. You're in luck because today is the day. We're going to study the fourth commandment in which the Israelites were commanded to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Now, I think this is a really important topic for us to think through. It's likely as you go about your day and work with different people, you're going to come across Seventh-day Adventists and others that say Saturday is still the Sabbath, and on Saturday we need to not work, we need to go to church on Saturdays, we need to do all these different things on Saturdays and still keep some of those laws. Or it's possible maybe you grew up in a home that had really strict rules for Sundays. And sun, on Sundays you were prohibited from doing anything. I once heard about a story about a family that had a TV hidden in the attic. And the reason why they had the TV in the attic was on Sundays they would go to watch TV there so no one would see that they were breaking the Sabbath. It's possible you've never heard about this. And you're wondering, is there something different about Sundays? Should we do something different on those days than we do on other days? Or maybe you've been asked the question, should we as Christians still obey the Ten Commandments? And you said, yes. And then you said, but what about four? Hmm. So today I'd like to answer the question, what does the Bible say about the Sabbath? And by answering that question, I hope to answer a few other questions. Should we as Christians observe the Sabbath? And if so, in what ways should we do it? And that's my goal today. So let's pray and we'll begin. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I am in awe as we stop and worship you. To know that one day you're coming and it's going to be a glorious day. Or to reflect that you're strong and kind. And when we're weak or burdened or struggling, we can come to you because you're strong and kind. As we talk about setting aside time for you, setting aside a day for you, I just pray that as we study this together, you will help us to see the value in why you created rest. But also see the freedom we have in Christ. Lord, I pray that you'd speak through your word clearly today. In your name we pray, amen. We're going to begin by going to Genesis 2, 1. In Genesis 1, God created everything that exists. He, he created it uh, just by speaking it to existence. And he had the six days. And then in Genesis 2, 1, it says this. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. But the seventh day God had finished the work he had been doing, so on the seventh day he rested from all of his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Now take note of something. God didn't need a nap. God didn't come to day seven and he was so exhausted that he, he said, I need to rest. God doesn't need rest. In fact, God created the Sabbath for our benefit. In Mark 2, Jesus says this. He said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. God in his infinite mercy and in his infinite wisdom knew that we could not do seven days a week every week. He knew the toll that would take on our body and mind. <laughs> 
I was meeting with a man this week who was pursuing ministry. It was a tremendous blessing, a young man I've invested in over the years. And we were talking about options and, and maybe going to Bible college and all these different things. And I walked through my life and I walked through different seasons. And I've had two seasons in my life where basically early morning to late at night was nonstop. When I was in my late 20s, I went back to college. I worked full-time pretty much while going to school full-time, to college full-time, and also doing, working, doing work in a church. And from the early morning, every morning, to late at night when my head hit the pillow, I did not have a moment to rest. It was about two years. The second time was a little bit longer than two years. It was two years before I started at North Park. I went back to seminary and worked practically full-time, went to seminary full-time, and from the early morning to late at night, I did not stop. And because of that, I was exhausted. And I talked to this young man. I said, sometimes there are seasons in life where we have to do that. But that's not how God has designed us. In fact, God designed Sabbath for us to take time to rest, to step back, to take time to refocus. And so when you have seasons of life like that, you can sustain it for a season. But long term, that kind of, that kind of day and pattern has effects on your marriage, on your family, on your health, and your will of being. So God established a pattern for us that is for our good. He said he blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all of his work, creating all that he had done. And it was a good thing. <laughs> now what we don't see here in Genesis is God commanding people to obey the Sabbath. We have no recounted history of Abraham or Isaac or Jacob or Noah or Adam celebrating the Sabbath. The first instance we have of the Sabbath is in Exodus 16, while Israel was on the way to Mount Sinai. If you remember that part of the, Pastor John talked about this, they were on their way, they didn't have any food, and God provided manna from heaven. And what, every day they were only to collect exactly what they needed for that day. If they saved any and got too many, the next day when they came back, there would be, it would spoil but God did something special on the sixth day. On the sixth day, he told them to go out and, get, and gather a double portion, to gather enough food for that day and for the next day. And on the seventh day, they were to not go out and gather any. And God miraculously made the manna last an extra day. And God established a principle for the Israelites. One, they were to trust him. They would trust that he would provide manna every day. They weren't supposed to gather more than what they needed. They were supposed to go out and gather their daily bread. But two, on the sixth day, they were to trust that God would provide enough so that on the seventh day, they didn't have to go out and work. And we see right off the bat, some of them go out on the seventh day and try to collect, or, and God's like, no, no, don't do that. And so we start to have this principle. And then in Exodus 20, a few chapters and a few weeks later at Mount Sinai, we have the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord has made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. One more. Therefore, the Lord God blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. See, God commanded the Israelites to observe the Sabbath, and this was a really serious command. In fact, later, there was a death penalty for those that intentionally went out and worked on the Sabbath. And even fast forward even later, one of the reasons why the Israelites were punished and sent into exile was because they didn't obey and observe the Sabbath. And God didn't just have a Sabbath rest on the seventh day. If you look at the nation of Israel, there was a rest in the seventh year, and there's a special rest on the 70th year. And throughout the, throughout the year, they had these festivals, and within the festivals, there were these patterns of rest, time to stop and reflect on what God is doing, time to pause and remember who God is and what he had done. Now, last week, as we talked through the Ten Commandments, we re reminded you that the laws tell something about the law maker. When God designed the Ten Commandments, he designed it for them to thrive. 
both individually and as a nation. It was about how God intends us to live, what is best for us and what is best for our society. God wanted Israel and Israelites to thrive. And so he gave them the Sabbath, a purposeful day each week to pause, rest, and reflect on the goodness of God. And these are good patterns for us. We need in our lives times where we pause and reflect. Every year on August 10th, I stop and pause and reflect that I have now been married for 22 years. Now next year will be 23 and the year after that 24. But it's a good day to pause and reflect and think about what God has done in our marriage. Every year, my wife and I go to either weekend to remember or couples retreat. Why do we do that? We do that so we can take time to work on our marriage, to pause and reflect. We're very intentional with our vacations to make sure we use them so we have time as a family to pause, rest, and reflect. Even the words we say, there are certain phrases we build into our lives, hopefully, to cause us to remember. Every Saturday, or every Sunday morning when we gather, I say, rejoice in the Lord. Always. And again I say, rejoice. And I do that for a very sp- special reason. Because some days you're going to come here and your hearts are going to be heavy. Some days you're going to come here and you're going to have had a really hard week. And it's a good reminder, even in the hard weeks, even in the difficult days, to rejoice. Because God is still good. And so we build these rhythms. When I send out emails to the church from North Park News, I always end with the same phrase, humbly serving together. It's a reminder to me that I'm not important. God is. It's a reminder to me that I can't accomplish anything on my own. We need to do this together. And so sometimes they're they're words, sometimes they're patterns. And we do this to, to stop. So, so what did the Israelites do on a Sabbath? I like to think of two words, work and worship. First, they did no work. We all need a pattern of break where we don't do work. But it wasn't just to stop working. It had a different purpose. See, Numbers 28 says there was a special offering made to the Lord on the Sabbath. Psalm 92 describes a song they would sing on the Sabbath. The Sabbath was a day of reflection and remembering. Deuteronomy 5 talks about the pattern that on the Sabbath you would stop and remember that God is a God that delivered them out of Egypt, that he called them out of his people. It was a day of trust. We pray, give us this day our daily bread, trusting that God would provide for our needs. But often, we worry. We stress. We get the bills at the end of the month, and we look at them, and we think, I don't know, I don't know if I can make it. And the temptation for the Israelites was the same. They were an agrarian society, and they're looking out their crops, and they're going, if I don't go out there today and do something in the fields, I might not have what I need. If I don't go to the market today and sell my stuff, I might not have enough money to do what I need. And so this Sabbath day was built in for the Israelites to help them to learn to trust God, that God would provide everything they need. Now fast forward to chapter 31. It says, The Israelites are to observe the Sabbath, celebrating it for the generations to come as a lasting covenant. It will be a sign between me and the Israelites forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. The Sabbath was a sign between me and the Israelites, between God and the Israelites. In the same way that the rainbow was a sign of the Noahic covenant, and circumcision was a sign of the Abrahamic covenant, the Sabbath was a sign to Israel. Ezekiel repeats this thought in Ezekiel 20. Keep my Sabbaths holy that they may be a sign between us. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. So the Sabbath was a sign between Israel and the Lord. Now by the time Jesus had come around, because of the exile, the Pharisees had started to create all these boundaries around the Sabbath. The Mishnah gave 39 categories of work that are restricted. 
But of the 39, they made hundreds of rules to put a fence around the law to make sure that you wouldn't break the Sabbath. Things like this. You could not spit on the Sabbath because it would disturb the dirt and you'd be guilty of plowing. You could not swat a fly on the Sabbath because that would be considered hunting. I know in the summer I often go hunting for flies because they drive me nuts. Have you ever had that zzz? Anyways. A woman could not look at her reflection because she would be tempted because she might see a gray hair and want to pluck it. I'm not making this stuff up, okay? The, we, the weird thing about the gray hairs is they, they, they go straight. The other hairs go down, so it's just weird. Like, I'm getting gray now, and they just poke out, and then I know I need, when they... I, anyways. <laughs> now, this is the weirdest one for me. If your house was burning down and you wanted to save your clothing, you couldn't carry your clothes out of the house because that would be considered working. So, if you went in your house while it's burning, put all your clothes on over your other cloaks, and ran out of the house, that is good. I mean, this is just, the, 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 they were taking the rules, and they were putting this fence around. Now, their intention was good. They're saying, we were sent into exile because we broke the Sabbath. And so we need to put a fence around it to make sure we don't break it. And, and maybe some of you grew up with some fences that now might seem silly, you know? Not to play face cards because they're associated with gambling. You can play Rook and you can play Phase 10. You can play other cards, but you can't have the ones. The, I, I grew up, I didn't know the difference between a spade and a club. And I remember playing Euchre for the first time. I was so confused. I was, you know, maybe you've seen some of those fences. So they were trying to do something good. Make sure they obeyed the law. But what they did is they put these fences around it to try and make sure you don't even come close to breaking the law. Their intention was good. And so because of that, the Pharisees accused Jesus constantly of breaking the Sabbath. There was a uh, famous American preacher who a few months preached on one of these. I don't recommend him, but his main point was that God broke the law for love. That was his driving point. But Jesus didn't break the law. <laughs> he kept the Sabbath. He, he broke the, the, the extra rules that they had created around the Sabbath. He broke their traditions. Jesus was the only one who perfectly kept the law. And that's the whole point of the law we looked at last week. It points us to the fact that we can't perfectly keep it. But Jesus did. And he then, because of that, fulfilled the law. And then, so one of the arguments that Seventh-day Adventists and others would argue that say we need, to, we need to observe the Sabbath and we need to observe it on Saturday because Jesus observed the Sabbath. What would Jesus do? We've got to brace it, right? But Galatians 4 says that Jesus was born under the law in order to redeem those under the law. In Mark 2, Jesus claimed to be the Lord of the Sabbath, and Hebrews 4 talks about how Jesus actually is our Sabbath rest. The rest we found in the Old Testament in the Sabbath is ultimately found in Jesus, and one day will be fully found in the end. So before we move to the New Testament, I want to give you my summary statement so far. Because the Sabbath was a sign of the Mosaic Covenant and believers are no longer under the Old Covenant, we are not bound to observe the Sabbath as outlined in the Mosaic Law. Let me repeat that. Because the Sabbath was a sign of the Mosaic Covenant and believers are no longer under the Old Covenant, we are not bound to observe the Sabbath in the way outlined in the Old Testament. And I believe I can say that confidently because if God still wanted us to keep the Sabbath in the way that it's ordained in the Mosaic Covenant, you would think there'd be at least one place in the New Testament from Acts through Revelation that would command us to obey the Sabbath. Now, if you remember with the new church starting, so the church started among Jews, and as it spread, a whole bunch of Gentiles started coming to know Christ. And that brought questions. What do Gentiles have to do to be part of God's covenant people, which has now been expanded? Do they have to get circumcised? Do they have to follow the dietary laws? Can they eat bacon? Good answer is yes. 
But one of the questions that came from that was, do they have to follow the Sabbath? And in Acts 15, the apostles and a number of Jewish, uh, a number of leaders came together to ask this question, and this was their conclusion. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from food sacrifice, from idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You would do well to avoid these things. That would have been a very easy time for them to say, and make sure you obey the Sabbath laws that are in the Old Testament. If that was a rule for all believers, you would think that would be a good rule to communicate. Instead, the apostles argued the opposite. In Colossians 2, Paul writes, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, or a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Now, Paul uses the same word that's going to be used by the author of Hebrews when he talks about the, the law and, the, and all the, the, the food things. He says, they are a shadow. Let's go to Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, the author of Hebrews says, the law is a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the reality themselves. The Sabbath, the Old Testament sacrifices, and the law pointed to Jesus and were fulfilled by him. In Romans 13, the the early church was arguing about what to eat and saying, do Christians have to follow the dietary laws and do they have to observe the Sabbath? And Paul writes this in, in Romans 5. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. So there's this conflict going on in the church about should we, do we have to set aside Saturday or do we have to set aside Sunday or is there something we have to do? <laughs> and others are saying, no, we can, we can celebrate every day alike. And just like that, there are going to be different opinions in North Park about, about the Sabbath and what we should do with it. But Paul's greater argument here is that we should not judge those that have a different conviction. In fact, if someone has a conviction that when they need to set aside the Sabbath day, they should do so unto the Lord. It's an important thing for them to do. Don't judge them for that. They're doing a good thing. If someone has a different conviction, but they do that unto the Lord, that can be a good thing. So it's stated again, as Christians, we do not have a command to observe the Sabbath as expressed in the Mosaic law. But then why do we worship on Sundays? The Sabbath was on Saturdays. Why do we gather on Sundays? Why don't we gather on Saturday nights? Well, Jesus rose and appeared to the disciples on the first day of the week, and so it's a day to celebrate. The Lord has risen The regular pattern of the early church was to worship on the first day of the week. We see it time and time again. And by the time uh, John writes Revelation in the 90s, he calls, that's not the 1990s, that's the 090s. What do you call 090s? The, The OG 90s. In the original 90s, Paul calls Sunday the Lord's Day. The Lord's Day. And so that's why we call it that. Now as Christians... We have to ask, was the Sabbath just replaced by the Lord's Day? Is the Lord's Day the Sabbath? I was on the board, I am on the board at Lincoln Lake Baptist Youth Camp. And uh, for years, they didn't have their own doctrinal statement. They used the New Hampshire Confession from 1833. And this summer, we had some counselors who were coming to work, and they they read the statement. They said, I I can't sign this because I don't agree with it. And this is what the New Hampshire Confession of 1833 says. We believe that the first day of the week is the Lord's Day or Christian Sabbath. So they are making a a determination that the Sabbath has been replaced. The Lord's Day is now the Christian Sabbath. And it's to be kept sacred to religious purposes by abstaining from all secular labor and sinful recreations, by the devout observance of all the means of grace, both private and public, and preparation for the rest that remaineth for the people of God. And it causes a number of questions. First off, what are sinful recreations? If they're sinful, shouldn't we abstain from them every single day? If it's 
If it's sinful just because it happens on Sunday, how do you decide which things are sinful recreations and which aren't? Is it sinful to go for a walk? Well, what if the walk involves prayer? Okay, that's good. What if the walk involves talking about your fantasy football team? Not good. You know, there, you have to try and take these rules out and, and flesh it out. <clears throat> it also says they're to keep from any secular work. Secular labor. So what I am doing right now would be considered fine because this is Christian labor. But the 1833 Confession says if you were to work on a Sunday, then you are violating this principle. And I don't think we see that in scriptures. Now, I will say, I, when I, before I became a pastor, I worked so hard to not work on Sundays. I remember sitting in an interview for Wendy's. And in order to be a manager at Wendy's, you have to have an open schedule. And I remember sitting in the interview, and I handed in my availability. And they said, well, to be a manager at Wendy's, you have to have an open availability. I said, that's awesome. To hire me, this is my availability. And I did say, now, if someone calls off and someone's sick or you need me to work on Sundays because someone's on vacation, I'm willing to do that. But I want to protect I so value going to church every Sunday morning. I can't miss that. It is, it is a core to who I am. Now, some of you don't have that choice. <laughs> some of you are, are watching this tonight or tomorrow because you're at work. And I would say that you are not sinning. That is not a sin. But I also say, if you can, do your best to, to have Sundays off so you can gather and worship. And so, as we reflected on this, the board said, okay, we need to write a statement, and so we actually wrote our own doctoral statement for the board that will be voted on real soon. But I want to ask an important question, though. In 1833, why did they put this fence in place? Why did they do this? And I would argue that they did it for very good reasons and a very good purpose. See, there's, there's pendulum swings that happen in life. And for those of us that grew up with rules that we felt were kind of silly, we tend to go too far on the other end. And whereas the younger generation highly, or the older generation highly valued Sundays and set it apart, I think we may have swung too far. I think in our pushback against the rules, we lose sight of the value that existed in the older generation. We'll lose sight of what they were protecting. We'll lose sight of the purpose of what they were doing. We'll lose sight in the goodness. And so I don't want you to think the whole purpose of the sermon was to say, we don't have to observe the Sabbath, but rather, here is my purpose of the sermon. It is good for Christians to practice the principles of the Sabbath. It is good for Christians to practice the principles of the Sabbath. As we go around and we ask people questions, one of the questions we ask is, how are you? There was an immigrant who had come to America who didn't know English very well, and she learned to ask, how are you? And as she went around asking, how are you? A common answer came back. And the answer was this, I'm busy. And so this immigrant thought the word I'm busy meant I'm good, because she heard it so often. But it's so easy for us to get so busy. I, I did a, a little research this week, and I, I, I spent a couple hours, way too long, just researching the busyness and the stress and all that stuff, and I started to put it all in the sermon, and eventually I just took it all out because of this. We all feel it. We all know we're too busy. We all know that our pace is too fast. We don't need a study to show it. We don't need someone to say it. We feel it. In the two years leading up to me being at North Park while I was going to seminary full-time and and working pretty much full-time, I had to take every single moment that I had and be productive. And in fact, I, during that season, felt guilty if I wasn't being productive because I had so much homework and so much work. And so when I finally finished seminary, I remember, I remember that night going home and the kids went to bed and I went to Sandy. I don't have to do anything. 
I don't have to do any homework. We can do whatever we want. We can, we can stay up late. We can go to bed early. We can watch a TV show. We can read a book. We can do whatever we want. This is awesome. But it took me a while to learn how to rest because for two years I had pushed so hard that I had forgotten how to rest. And every moment that I had a break, I was thinking about what I should be doing. Part of the sabbatical that was such a blessing from the church was to stop and pause and just be with God, to not have an agenda, to not have something that has to be done. I think that's the beauty of what the Sabbath was. In Psalm 127, God says, it is vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. So many in this room are going morning to night, pushing, pushing, pushing. And maybe you need a day of rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Jesus said, Come to me all who are weary and burdened. Or the, this version, labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. In Mark, the Gospel of Mark, Jesus sent out the 12 out to different cities to go and do ministry. And when they came back, I'm sure they were exhausted. And Jesus says this, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. In my sermon on Mark 6, if you want to look it up later, I had three points. And that was this. First, the Bible teaches rest. We see it in the patterns that God set up for the nation of Israel. Not just the Sabbath, but the festivals and every seven years and every 70 years. The Bible teaches these patterns are good. Second, Jesus modeled rest. We see time and time again after he's with the crowds that he withdraws to be with the Father. And lastly, Jesus invites us to rest. He invites us to rest in him. These patterns are throughout the scripture, but we live in a society that's so fast-paced where it's go, 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 be productive, don't ever stop and just be silent. And the temptation also is, when we have a moment of rest, is to do this. Scroll on Facebook, because I know during the election season that provides lots of rest. to see what's going on in everybody else's lives, to watch something, to read something. But maybe today, God wants you to just put the phone down and be with him. We were created for rest. God created the Sabbath for our benefit. Mark 2, Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The law shows the character of the law giver. And the law giver laid out the Ten Commandments and said, you need a day to stop and to pause and to reflect on who I am and to remember what I have done and to think about me. And the lawmaker created the law for the thriving of the nation of Israel. And if it was a law for the thriving of the nation of Israel, it's probably something that would be good for us to observe in some way, shape, or form. I land with three reasons why we should observe a Sabbath. Now, I don't think we have to observe the Sabbath in the same way that they did in the Old Testament, because that was the Old Covenant, the Mosaic Covenant. And I'm not saying that this is something we have to do, that God, God has not ordained this is what you have to do. But I, what I believe is that the principles that God gave in this are for our benefit. And so because of that, there's three things here. First, a consistent pattern of rest is good for us. A consistent pattern of rest is good for us. I take Mondays off, and I love Mondays. I love Mondays. I turn my email off, and John yells at me if I don't, and I send an email. I try not to answer phone calls unless you leave me a voicemail on something really significant. I try to just take the day off of work. I, for me, I put it on Mondays because there's nothing that has to be done. I tried to have my days off on Fridays, but there was always something that needs to be done. And so on Mondays, I can just rest. I can, 
And so maybe for you, you need to have a, a rule for your day off. Maybe, maybe you need to turn off your cell phone or put it on silent or not check email or, or, or not go on to social media those days. Maybe there's certain things you say, I'm not going to do, and certain things that say, I'm going to do on my day off. A consistent pattern of rest is good for us. Second, setting aside a time or a day for the Lord is good for us. I almost structured the sermon around three words. Rhythm, rest, and relationship. That we create these rhythms that are to honor God. We rest in God. And we find our rest in that relationship with him. See, Jesus said, come to me all who are weary and burdened, for I will give you rest. Some of you have been striving so hard that you can find that rest somewhere else. That you can find that satisfaction in something else. If I just put a few more hours in this week, we'll finally get to what I want to get. We'll finally reach our goals. If I just keep working harder and harder, we'll have the retirement eventually that we want to have. We push so hard to find what we need. But Jesus is inviting us. Come to me, all who are weary. And recognizing that that rest is not found in a phone, it's not found in a job, it's not found in a spouse, it's not found in anything in this life except for Christ. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus. And you've been trying to find that satisfaction something else. You've been working so hard, you've been pursuing it so fast, and you find that every time you feel like you're going to get at satisfaction, you grasp at it, it's like grasping at sand. It just goes through your fingers. Today, Jesus is inviting you, come to him and find rest. The God of the universe, seated on the throne in heaven, chose to come down to this earth and experience tiredness. So he needed to go away and rest with his father to experience pain, to experience betrayal. And he lived a perfect life and he followed the Sabbath and every other rule in the the Ten Commandments perfectly, unlike we can, so that he could die a perfect death in our place so that we could have life. So if you don't know that Savior today, turn to him. Come find me. Come find the person that brought you and ask him, how can I know I'm saved? How can I know who my Savior is. And third, gathering as a church is good for us. What we do on Sunday mornings is not because we're bored. You've heard my sermons. I know you don't come here because you're bored. We come here because God has created the church And it's this beautiful thing. In Ephesians, it talks about the manifold witness of God as being known to the rulers and authorities through the church. (laughs) This is more than just a time to get together and sing. When I was on sabbatical, the thing that I disliked the most (laughs) was I didn't get to be with you guys every Sunday. It was a special thing when you gather together as a church body. There are a number of churches in our fellowship that have decided to stop doing their sermons or their, their, their services online, live stream, because they want people to come. They don't want to be excused. Now, we're not going to do that because we have people who are shut-ins, we have people who are sick, we have people who are on vacation who want to engage, and so we're going to keep doing it. But, but the reason, the purpose, the value that they're assigning is they're saying there's something different about when we gather. This is important. This is a value. That's why from the time my kids were born, I've taught them the value of being in church. And I taught them I love the church and I want them to love the church too. Because the church is a blessed place. When we come here, we don't just come to listen and sing. We come to engage in worshiping the God who created all things. We come to remember what he's done. As we sing the songs, we're reflecting on what God has accomplished through the cross. We're reflecting on his character and who he is. As we open God's word and we study it, we say, God, I want to be more like you. I want to learn your word and I want to do it. And so there's value in gathering as a church. And I just want to remind you, though, when this is addressed in the New Testament, the issue of Sabbath, is genuinely addressed as some people do this 
and some people do this, and we're to love each other. And so as you think through what a Sabbath might look like in your home and your life, I just want to caution you against going to somebody else and saying it should be that. So we're not hiding our TVs in our attics. Today, I will go home and I will cook delicious wings. I'm so excited. I will cook a lot of wings because Sandy is gone and my nephews are here and we're going to have a lot of wings. And they're going to be delicious. And I will sit down and I will rest on my recliner and watch the Detroit Lions hopefully win. And if you choose, as a believer, to not watch TV on Sunday, that's okay. If you choose to not watch football, that's okay. It's also okay that I choose to watch football. And so we need to be careful as we establish these rules to not judge others that have a different rule because the Mosaic rule command was a sign between the nation of Israel and God, and that has been fulfilled in Christ. But I also, tomorrow, I'm going to stop and rest. And tomorrow I'm going to open God's word. I'm going to spend time with him. I'm going to think through the week. I'm going to reflect on what God has done. Because these principles of the Sabbath are really important to me. And I firmly believe that for every one of us here, they'll look differently in each of your lives. But the principle of the Sabbath should have an impact on your life. Because God is our creator and he knows what's best for us. And the Sabbath was created for our benefit. And if it has, and if we saw it observed in the Bible as a time to reflect on God's goodness, part of that Sabbath rest should be finding our rest in Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness and your grace. Thank you that we're in a church full of different people with different opinions and different convictions. And some in this congregation would set aside today and would make special things to do today to make sure it's a day to reflect and remember you. Others may choose Monday. Others may choose a different day. But Lord, all, help all of us to choose to be intentional about resting, but not just resting from work, finding our rest in you. Help us to be intentional to create rhythms and patterns in our life where we set aside things in order to engage with you, in order to be with you, in order to find our satisfaction in you, in order to be recharged by you, in order to experience your grace and your mercy anew. In your name we pray, amen.